morning, City of Joy. How we doing? Y'all good? Okay. Praise God. Praise God that Jesus is alive. And uh, there's not a better song that I'd rather come up to than that one right there, Jesus be the center of it all. Because it reminds me the true reality that Jesus is the center and how quickly I could forget that. And so I praise God for songs like that that center my heart back on Jesus. Him being the center has nothing to do with us as much as it has to do with who he is and who we are through him. Amen. And so I just praise God that there's a God that loves us this morning, that cares for us, that's ready to nurture us in his word like a father. The, a good father does his children. And so I just want to uh, first say I've enjoyed the last series that we went through. I don't know about y'all, but the Nehemiah that Pastor K went through, it just, it was right on time. It was speaking to us, speaking to me individually, speaking to our community, speaking to what God's doing right now in the present time. He did this hundreds of years ago, <laughs> long time ago, and he's doing it now. And he's letting us look back into this historical time and, 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 and it's speaking to us now. It's amazing. So I just am so thankful for Pastor Kay and just the way that he brought us that word. And I, I'm just thankful for his leadership and the way that he keeps leading us by the spirit into what God will have for us. And so I believe that just like how God did with Nehemiah in Jerusalem, he's doing in our community. He's raising up leaders just like Nehemiah who are trusting in God and, and being led by him and believing that God's going to do an incredible work. Amen. Is God able to do an incredible work? He, 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 he's done it. He will do it again. He is doing it. It's, it's present right now. He is doing that work. And so I'm grateful. And so as I think about the, the, the sermons that Kenton preached and, you know, everything we learned about Nehemiah and Jerusalem, it, it, that's amazing. But sometimes it's hard to grab hold of that faith that Nehemiah had. It can almost seem like it, it's, it's so far from what I feel is capable or God can do in my life. And so the goal for to, today is that I really want to spend time talking about what does it mean to have the kind of faith that Nehemiah had? And what does it look like to trust God to do something in my life and in our community? And I believe that it all depends on what you believe about the authority and power of Jesus Christ. That, that's what, that, that is going to be what I want to spend time today talking about. So we're going to spend uh, the rest of the time going through an encounter about the, uh, a centurion soldier and the faith that he had in Jesus. And we're, we're going to go in the book of Matthew, and it's going to help us wrestle around of what it means to trust in the power of Jesus in our lives. And so the interesting thing is, is that leading up to the, to the passage that we're going to be going through today in chapter 8, we see in chapter 7, verse 29, Jesus is said to have the kind of authority that no one has. People, people are seeing him do all these miracles and all these miraculous signs, and they're just like, none of our teachers are like this. Nobody's like this man, Jesus. He, it's like he has an authority, that, that just a power that it, it, it can't be denied. You know what I'm saying? When somebody has a power and authority that can't be denied, it's, He's not like the other religious people that we see telling us to do things. He actually doing things. <laughs> he's not just telling you to do things. He's doing it. And he's saying that that is what authority is. And we see also going into chapter 8, the first verses of chapter 8, he heals a leper of leprosy, and he's showing that he has authority over even any physical ailments or of any body bodily harm or kind of dysfunction that there is Jesus healed the leper so he's showing he has authority over even a physical body so we begin to see this theme of authority and we understand authority to some degree in our lives we've seen it we understand we are supposed to obey our parents obey the law there's different things that can happen and there's if you have a teacher she can exercise authority in a classroom correct yeah. and so we understand the kind of authority that we see in our lives it's the power, here's a definition, the power or right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. So with that in mind, I just want to take some time to go through this encounter and see how Jesus' authority and his power is on display. So if you want to turn to the book of Matthew, 
We're going to be in uh, chapter 8, verses 5 through, through 13. And so you guys can go ahead and uh, turn to that real fast. I'll, got, I'll give you guys a second. It'll be up on the screen as well. All right, so I can go ahead and start off in verse 5. When he had entered uh, Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is par lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to the other, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And, and, the centurion said, uh, and to the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you as you have believed, and the servant was healed at that very moment. Amen. That's God's word right there. And it's just, it just amazes me. This has always been my favorite passage. And let me tell you why. It's because it just highlights what it means to have faith in Jesus. It just doesn't make sense to the physical, natural eye, because he looks crazy. He just came to Jesus. He said, I have a friend, a servant who is paralyzed and suffering terribly. Like, can you do something about it? Jesus said, yes, I will do something about it. I, I'll come with you. Where are you at? Let's go. I'm ready to go. He's like, stop. Stop. No. You can't come with me. He must be like, bro, why are we here? <laughs> why did you come to Jesus to tell him that? And he just said, you're gonna, he's, he's going to come with you. That, that in of itself is amazing for Jesus to say, I'll come with you to your house. you walking with Jesus the whole way. Like, Let, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Like, yeah, just he's, he's, do, he's doing real bad. I can't wait for you to meet him and, you know, heal him and touch him. He said, no, I'm unworthy for you to come into my house. And, 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 and not only that, but he actually said he addressed him as Lord. And so he's understanding who this God is that he's heard about. And so he already understood who Jesus was. And when you understand who Jesus is, you understand that you're way different because you're in the presence of God and you just don't. I'm unworthy for you to come into my house. And then he also said, I know what authority is like. I'm a, I'm a centurion. I'm a Roman soldier. I have people underneath me. And you know the Roman Empire, they do not play around. They, they, when they say something, it's done. It's over with. They could take a life just like that just with a word of somebody with authority. And so he says, look, I understand authority. Say the word and it's done. And Jesus marveled. That's the, it's amazing. The one thing that'll get Jesus to marvel is when somebody has a faith that believes God at who he said he is. That's it. Believe God at who he said he is. Nothing else that you could do can get God to marvel. It's really when you see him for who he is. And so Jesus marveled and he looked at the people, and this is what gets me. He's, all these, these people who are following him, maybe they might even claim themselves to be disciples of Jesus. Jesus turns to them, he say, in all of Israel, I haven't seen any faith like this. In Israel, I'm talking about people who are claiming to be the people of God. And you know why? It's because a lot of them really didn't see Jesus for who he was. They just thought he was a man doing cool things. So they following him. But, but no, Jesus is not just a man. He's God of the universe. And he's doing miracles right in front of their eyes. Amen. And so it's clear to me that this centurion had the understanding of the power of God's authority, of Jesus's authority, and he acted on it. He responded to what, what, what happens when you see Jesus for who he is? And so this story, how is it going to help us experience the power of Jesus' authority? What is that going to do for us? I got three things from this uh, text that I, I want to suggest that could, that could help us 
believe and trust in the power of God's authority. So first, number one, you have to tell Jesus your problem. Check it out, look. First, first, first verse we see in, uh, in verse five and six. He came, he, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him. Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. We, we, right off the bat, he got straight to the problems. My servant is suffering terribly, and I need somebody to do something about it. Immediately, he didn't waste time, small talk. Hey man, so where'd you guys come from? Where'd you guys, you know, what you guys eating today? I'm good, I'm doing fine, you know, the Roman Empire's great. You know, we doing our thing as we usually do. No, he didn't do any of that. He said, I have a, I have a it was urgent. I have a problem. And so that's what God is trying to reveal to us. When we have a problem, we take it to somebody we believe can do something about it, right? When I have a medical issue, who am I gonna go to? If, 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 I, if I really want to get something done about it, who am I gonna go to? Doctor, ASAP. I'm not gonna go to somebody off random off the street like, yeah, I'm kind of feeling this little ache in my back, what you think I should do? No, I, they're probably not gonna be able to do anything to, uh, about it. So I wanna go to somebody who can do something about the problem. And so we see, obviously, the way that the centurion addressed Jesus, he knew who he was talking to, he said, Lord, right off the bat. I know who I'm coming to. I'm not just coming to some random guy that's some good teacher. Lord, the one that's healing leopards. Lord, the one that's doing incredible miracles. Lord, I, I, I'm speaking to the Lord of the universe. Not just a good teacher that I'm just kind of like hoping maybe he can figure something out. No, Lord. I addressed him as Lord because I knew that when I took my problems to him, he can do something about it. And so just like for us, what do we do with our problem? Ooh, that was, that was time to respond. I want to hear somebody's answer. What, what do we do with our problems? Yeah, solve them? Try to solve them, that's right. How do we solve them? I know sometimes the way I try to solve them is I suppress them. I'm like, man, get back down there. You don't need to come out. Ain't no problems in this world. You try to put it down and act like it's not there, but then all the stuff, it's, it's coming out. It's going to come out some way. You can't change some of these situations that you have in your life. So what are some other things we do? Hmm? Take them to God. That's right. But you know what's interesting? Sometimes, if I'm going to be honest, I don't know if everybody else is going to be honest, but sometimes I don't take them to God. He'd be the last one I tell about it. I'd be like, so yeah, tell her, man, I'm kind of struggling with this thing. What do you think I should do? Hey, what do you think I should do about that? I mean, yeah, you know, I'm just struggling. It's hard. It's challenging. And I just, I'm just stuck. You know what I mean? Whole time, God, like, in the prayer closet, like, fam, what's up? <laughs> you told everybody else. But there's almost this resistance to come to somebody who could do something about it. And maybe that's because if I had... A, a, a type of disease or sickness, sometimes I don't want to go to the doctor. Ooh, because he could do something about it. But that's scary sometimes to think that they're going to have to do something about it. And hey, we got to get that cancer up out of you, man. <laughs> and I don't want to always do or go to the person that can actually do something about it because sometimes it's easier for me to stay paralyzed in my situation and, 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 and not have to go through that process of changing or, or surrendering myself, yielding myself to, to, the, to the power and authority of somebody else. That's scary. But the question is, is do you want your problem or situation to change? That's the real question. And do you know who it is that you're going to to change your problem? So the second thing, well, first, before I go on, Telling your problems to, to God, what it looks like for us consistently, is, is to like we've been talking about. Take your problems to him. Call on his name. Reach out to him. I'm talking about God is a God that has a relationship with those who call him his father. He says, cry out to him. 
He says, cast your, in 1 Peter says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Yeah. That means we're in constant communication with God. When we have something on our hearts and our minds and say, God, I'm feeling this way, God. There's this situation that's going on and I don't know what I should do about it, but I know you can do something about it. Yeah. I know that you can lead me into a way that I can see a change. I can see your presence here. And so I want to challenge everybody to take your problems to God. Take the things that are on your heart and lift them up to the Lord and, and, and see what he does. Secondly, uh, to experience the power of Jesus' authority, you have to take Jesus at his word. So let's, let's look at uh, verse 7 through 10. And we see it very clearly. It says, what does the centurion uh, say after Jesus says, I will come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. But only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am too a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I, have, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I, seen, have I found such faith. Man, talk about understanding Jesus and taking him at his word. Thank you, Jesus. He makes it so clear. God reveals that to anybody in this room who wants to know who Jesus is. Because once you see who Jesus is, it's, it's easy for you to take him at his word because you see him for who he is. The centurion said, Jesus, you are holy, I am not. I understand authority. As a human, as a Roman soldier, I'm a centurion. There's probably hundreds of soldiers underneath him. He knows what happens when somebody asks a request. When he asks a request to his soldiers, they're going to do it. There's no question. No questions asked. And so when you understand something and it connects to your understanding of God, that causes you to be able to trust in his word. Think about that. The centurion understood authority because he was a Roman centurion. So he said, I know as a Roman soldier in the, in the empire, when I say something, it's done. And you know what? I see Jesus doing these miracles, and he's exercising the same type of authority, but a supernatural authority. I'm talking about he walking on water. He, I'm talking about he telling lepers, hey, hey, you're, you're clean. He's talking about the sight to the blind, you can see now. That's authority. I'm talking about the winds. Hey, stop. We're done. You're done here. And then the calm breeze on, 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 on the water. You see what I'm saying? Peace be still. That, that's, that's what it means to have authority. In the Roman centurion, he like, I literally give commands every day. And they're done 100% of the time. I get authority. I understand it. And I see Jesus exercising authority in a supernatural realm claiming he's God, he's God. Just simple as that, he's God. He's done everything that would show that he has the authority over everything in his world. So I'm going to come to him. And I'm going to take him at his word. Because when he says something, it's done. And that's what the centurion understood. That's why he had the kind of faith to go up to him and say, I'm unworthy for you to come into my house. Just say the word and he's going to be healed. Just say it. And I could go home comfortably, walking home with, with confidence, knowing that just like me, as a centurion, I say the word and it's done. Do we believe that? Do we believe that in our lives? Do we have that kind of faith that sees Jesus? It's not complicated. Do you see Jesus as he is? Do you see him as holy and we're not? Do we see him as authority over everything in this world? Your breath, your friends, your family, your community, your financial situation, your marriage. Does he have authority over all that? If he does, I can be in Jesus' presence. I can tell him my problems and I can leave confidently saying, I know God about to come through. I know it's not going to be a, a matter of can he do it. It's how he's going to do it. 
All right? Th that's really what it is. How is he going to do it? I want to almost, I want to just be in awe about, Lord, how are you going to do it? Because I know your word. I know your desires. I know you want to cause things to come back to life. I know you want to restore all things. So I can be hopeful and I could, I, I, I could trust in the person of Jesus. So I take him at his word. That is what we need to do in our lives, because sometimes it's like we don't take him at his word. Because we can say we take him at his word. Hey, all those people following him like, yeah, Jesus, man, he, he the teacher. He's, we're following him. He does all these great miracles. And man, Jesus is Lord, man. Jesus is Lord, right? Right, guys? He's, he's Lord. Did some cool things. But the thing is, why did Jesus say, Nowhere in Israel have I seen faith like this guy. Because true faith is going to reveal itself in when you see Jesus for who he is, in whatever problem, whatever situation you see, you're trusting him. Nothing's going to deter you from believing in God, no matter what you see. I mean, there's a lot of people who were following Jesus. Jesus said, yeah, you got to uh, drink my blood and eat my flesh. Smells his life got a role. And, and that's the kind of faith that's not faith at all. Because it's like, I can't understand it. What is he talking about? I need to eat his pizza. I got to go. That's too much. It's, no. I know who Jesus is. There's no other place that I would go other than in his presence and trusting in him. Over anything, over any circumstance, I can trust in his word. We got to trust and take Jesus at his word, y'all, because I don't think it's something that's natural to us. Yeah. It's really not. And that's why we need the help of the Holy Spirit to help us trust in God in the moments when it's hardest. Think about whatever it is in your life right now that it's hard to trust God, because I'm not going to sit here and act like it's so easy to trust in God in every single situation. Because yeah. there's some things you just almost feel a blockage in your heart saying, no, I don't want to ask God or, or, or trust him to do this thing in my life. And the thing is, is that we need to ask the Holy Spirit to grant us the ability to take Jesus at his word. It's a constant battle to say, Jesus, help me. Help me believe that my marriage is going to look different, that you can change my heart and, and, and my responses, and you can change how I view my finances. You can change how I, how I approach my relationships. You can change how I view people. You can change how I come into my workspace. You can change these things, and you might not see it. That's the hard part, because you could go into your workspace and be like, man, he still ain't did it yet. They, they're still tripping up in there, or I'm still going off on my coworker. <clears throat> but faith is saying, I don't see it, but he's doing it. I can take Jesus at his word. That, that, that's the difference right there. How are you going into your marriage? How are you going into your financial situations? Are you expecting God to move? Or is it just like, see, God doesn't care. He's still not doing it. We, we can respond in a way that shows we don't believe God's going to show up. Because how would your heart be? It'd be like the man going back to his servant be like, I don't think God even going to do this, man. Like, he, he probably, he, I don't know how long his walk was, but you know, he probably could have had some thoughts like, is he really, is he really God? Hey, I think so. I mean, I'm a Roman soldier, and I do authority. Jesus be doing all that. Okay, so I think he's going to do it. And so, oh, dang, I'm running out of rope. See, that? short walk. But um, so it's, it's really understanding, do I know who Jesus is? Am I walking in faith in my situation? When he left Jesus' presence, did he know for a matter of fact, in the physical realm, that his servant was healed? Did he know? Physically, was he able to see him like, yep, he did it, he did it. No, he did it. He didn't actually see his friends yet. He believed by faith that it was done. Yeah. That's the faith right there. My financial situation might not change yet in this moment. My marriage might not change yet in this moment. Yeah. But as I'm walking back to my situation, as I'm leaving God's presence, I'm saying, he did it. He can do it. He will do it. And the way that we know that is because we know who Jesus is. Do we know that he's a loving, caring God who desires to give himself to us? 
and desire to give us a love that's unlike any other love. That's, that's the foundation of your belief. It's the trust in a good, good father. It's to view God for who he is. And not, what, not, not based off what our situation looks like. That's not how we decide who God is. We look at what he's done, who he is, who he's shown himself to be. So we can take him at his word. So the third and final one, most importantly, is to experience the power of Jesus' authority. You have to trust Jesus alone for salvation. So let me uh, read verses 11 through 13. And here we have Jesus saying, Truly, when, uh, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you as you have believed. The, the servant was healed at that very moment. So like I said before, we have to see Jesus correctly as he is. And so the, mo the most important thing that Jesus is trying to get us to see, it's not just about this man's situation changing. He was revealed something that was far beyond that situation in his servant being healed. It's you saw Jesus for who he truly is. And look, I'm telling you guys, when you see Jesus for who he truly is, you're changed. Regardless of the situation, it's changing. You're changed because you just experienced the God of the universe, the creator of your soul, the one who has loved you. And, and, and knitted you together in your mother's womb. You have just met him. You've seen him for the first time, and that changes your life. And so this centurion, he came to him already convinced of who he was. And I believe that God is saying, when we see Jesus as he truly is, our lives change. We're never the same again, because the Holy Spirit comes into you and gives you that ability to believe that God is who he said he is. Because if you see anything that happens in the Bible, even with Peter, he said, flesh and blood didn't reveal to you that I'm the son of God and who I said I am, that I'm the Messiah. God in, in heaven revealed that to you. So it's God activating our faith to believe in him for salvation. So it's not, Jesus doesn't just care about your situation. He cares about our souls. He cares about our lives. It, it's, he, the situations may be a way that he uses to reveal who he is, yeah. but it's really about, I want to be connected to you. Yeah. I want you to know me because there's joy and satisfaction when you come into my presence and experience me and to be reconciled and brought back into a relationship with God. I'm telling y'all, this is the greatest Amen. news of all time that the God of the universe came down, revealed himself, yeah. saying, I'm God in the flesh, healed diseases, gave sight to the blind, and said, I'm coming to die in your place because I want you so badly to know the creator that created you. And I want you to know the love that you've been seeking your whole life, that, that, that you've probably been wounded and scarred and just a, a hole in your heart. I came to fill that. That's, that's the space for me. I came all the way down to tell you that. I, I want to fill you up with joy, and that's in my presence. And that's when you see Jesus for who he is. There's an incredible joy. I can't imagine that man leaving Jesus' presence saying, I already know my servant's healed. That's salvation. He didn't even have to get back. He knew he was healed because he experienced who Jesus was. The, the, the God, the Father in heaven revealed it to him. He was able to say, Lord, just say the word and, and he'll be healed. That's salvation. And when you look at the passage, it's just so clear to me because there's these people who are religious in Israel, the people of God, Israelites. They're supposed to be the ones following God's command. They know the book. They know the religious things to do. Jesus turned to them and said, I haven't seen faith like this. He marveled. He said, real faith. This is real faith right here. A lot of people think that they have faith in God until they're challenged with the authority of Christ. And then they turn around. And that's why Jesus says, in all of Israel, 
I haven't seen this kind of faith. And what's crazy is that the place that they're in, Capernaum, it, he goes on later to say some stuff about Capernaum, which is crazy because he did all kinds of miracles in Capernaum, and, and it was like they wouldn't believe. He did incredible things in Capernaum, and they wouldn't believe. You want to put that on the slide real quick? He said, let me see, it's in chapter 11. Put it up there. Okay, I'll just go to it. So he said this, and you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For in the mighty, if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would remain to this day. So y'all Bible readers, he just said it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom on the last day. In, 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 in another version, here it goes, he said, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You're going to be brought down to Hades separated from God because of the lack of faith, because of being a faithless person in Jesus. That's as simple as it goes. Faithless in Jesus. It says a lot of, a, 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 a lot of uh, people would say that they believe in Jesus, but is their life reflecting they understand the authority of Jesus, the power of Jesus? What it means to see Jesus and respond our lives would look radically different if we really believed in the power of Jesus. We would leave every situation knowing his will will be done. And I could trust him. And there's a joy in trusting him. It's just so deep because we know he's, he's love, his foundation is love, mercy. We know his desires are greater than any of ours. And when you understand that, you walk by faith. No matter what trials, no matter what situations, you're, you're not deterred. And so he goes on to say, be it done as you have believed. So God unlocks and activates our faith to be able to bring things into fruition. And that's crazy. When we take our problems to him and we take him at his word, he activates our faith to believe that he can do exactly what he said he would and we can walk enjoy in, in the in-between. We don't have to see those things happen to be like, oh, yes, thank you, Jesus, for being good. It's, no, it's, it's, it's in-between time. Praises saying, you are worthy regardless. There's a reason why he said, you, I'm unworthy. You shouldn't even come to my house. That's where he understood that, Jesus, you can do what you want. You don't even have to come to my house. I'm unworthy. What is it? What happened when uh, uh, Jesus told them to put the fish on, uh, to put the, cast the net onto the other side of the boat when they had been fishing all night? These, these are fishermen. He like this. Jesus, come on, bro. Like, come on, just, just show us some respect. We do this for a living, man. Like, come on. But be okay, since you said, scooped it. I'm talking about all the fish in the sea came up. The, I'm talking about they just dropped down and just saying, like, you got to leave us, man. Like, you God, that's crazy. Like, I don't even feel, it, it's, I, I love being in your presence, but it's also uncomfortable, because it's like, you can do things that nobody else can do. Yeah. And that's what it means to have faith. He's different than us. But we are able to worship who he is in that him being different, because he does it for his glory and for our joy. And so I'm thankful for that. So it's not just about your situation, it's about your soul, it's about your salvation. God cares about your soul, understanding who Jesus is. You know, sometimes we so focused on our situation, like, man, I, I just want to understand who Jesus is so he can change this. I just want to understand Jesus so he can do that. No, I want to see Jesus for who he is so he can be in my life. You know what I'm saying? So that he can be in my heart that he could be in my soul, that he could be a part of every single area of my life, and that for the rest of my life I can walk with him, that I could enjoy this God who loved me so much that he would die in my place. And it's crazy. Like, this isn't the, 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 the necessarily the easiest part to share, but Jesus is saying those who don't have the faith that he's talking about 
of, of seeing Jesus correctly for who he is, he's saying there's only one other place to go in outer darkness. He's telling people that, that claim to be the people of God, people that would probably quote you the Old Testament, these religious people, he's saying the kingdom was prepared for you. He said, God set it up for you. You were supposed to be in here. But you showed that that spot wasn't for you the moment you said, I, I don't see Jesus for who he is. The God of the universe. The, the one that God the Father sent down, the same God of Isaac, Jacob, and, and Abraham, is now revealed to you and you're saying, well, we don't, we don't look to him. You've just lost your seat. He said, you're going to be in outer darkness. And not only that, he said, the weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm talking about that is terrifying. You know what I'm saying? When somebody gnashing their teeth, grinding them together, that is terrifying. It's horrible. It's something that it, it shows torture. It kind of reminds me of a torture when you just, the agony. And Jesus is saying, and this is the person that actually came to keep you from doing that, from going there. So there's compassion in it. It's not like he's just saying that, dropping it and leaving and going back to where he was. He's saying, that's true for people who claim to be religious or spiritual or anybody who doesn't look upon the sun for salvation, to connect to their creator. That's, that's the only option. That's out of God's presence. It's either being in God's presence or away from God's presence. And so he also says, man, hold on, just, he said, let it be done as you have believed. And he, he, he said, people are going to come from all around the world reclining at the table. And this got to be humiliating or just hard to hear for Israelites. You, you know, like the person that Matthew, Jesus' disciple who wrote this, he's talking to a bunch of Israelites, Jewish people, religious people. And he's saying, look, y'all. Jesus said this, Gentiles, non-believers who don't have a, a spiritual background of knowing God, knowing his promises, they're going to be sitting at the table with Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob in the kingdom of God, feasting with God. They're going to be getting it in, in your place, because you spent all this time saying, yeah, Isaac, Jacob, Abraham, Moses, they're our fathers, they're great. You're not going to be sitting down with them. You feel what I'm saying? You're not going to be sitting down with them because you refuse to come to the one who all of them pointed to. That's, that's, just, that's just it. What did he say? Before Abraham was? I am. He just, I'm trying to let y'all know that I'm the one that everything in history points to. And so if you miss that, it's to, it's to miss the greatest alley-oop of all time. It's, it just is. He's setting it up. That it's Jesus, Son of God, salvation, sitting down with Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob. He's telling these religious people, if you don't see, and if you miss this critical piece, which is Jesus, I'm the one that they pointed to, your spot, you just forfeited it. I don't even got to take it from you. You forfeited it. Because you're not going to want to sit down in the kingdom. Because the kingdom is about Jesus. That, that's what it is. And so you have two decisions. You can either smash with Jesus in the kingdom of heaven, or you can gnash away from Jesus. He was ready for that. <laughs> I, we had talked about it, man, and we were just so hype about it. We said, you can either smash or gnash. That's crazy. He put, he put that to smash or not, like you want to smash with God in his presence and be with him, a feast, a celebration. I'm talking about of all time, the, 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 the introduction to all of eternity. You're sitting down with the greats, the greatest, but then also some other great men of faith who pointed to Jesus and walked with God. You enjoying them. And Jesus is saying there's going to be a bunch of non-Jewish people there that's sitting in spots that was prepared for the Israelites and they're smashing it while you being rejected and denied because you rejected and denied the most important piece of the faith and that's Jesus.
And, and that, that is just said to convict us even further to look, to make sure we're believing on Jesus. That's it. It's so simple, y'all. It's not deep. Who is Jesus? What has he done? Who has he revealed himself to be? I just got to take him at his word. And if I can take him at his word, that means I can take my problems to him. I know he can do something about it. He'll do something about my soul and my salvation. And I know that he can walk with me in my life and do things in my life that will transform my life in the way that I'm able to worship God and love people. That's the goal.